Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Popcorn Bucket List, the podcast that keeps your movie bucket list up to date because those thousand movies to see before you die lists are just too daunting. I'm your host and resident disaster film survivor, Gracie, and with me is Daryl, the Star Wars expert, and Sarah, our resident Gore Verbinski admirer. What's up? <laughs> Hi. All right, so I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. To She's going to take control of today's episode. Sarah, what are we doing today? All right, so as we kind of talked about in last week's episode, um, all of us have dabbled in film and making our own videos and short films and things like that. So today we're going to be talking about not movies that we love, but movies, and a lot of these we do love, but movies that inspired us to do that ourselves or just dive deeper or find out how movies are made or whatever it was. So um, Daryl's going to start us off this week with a movie that inspired him. Yeah, so um, so I, I, have, a, I have kind of a, a list of movies that have inspired me because I feel like there are several important stages. So the most important one I'm not going to say first, but let's start with uh, Monsters, Inc. is one of them. It was the first time that I really got an understanding of how much effort went into animated films. It was the first time I really like paid attention to how a movie was made. When the movie came out on DVD, I spent days and days and days just watching special features, just learning all about like the layout artists, like the effects artists. Like it was something that as a kid, I was like, whoa, it's more than just typing in your computer and making people move around. So it was a very, very important film to me. It's something that is one of those kinds of films I can think about all I can like memorize the cadence of it, just like the music and the sound effects, because I watched it over and over again. And I knew it's the first movie where I really knew how it was made. I and this is the movie. So I was talking with Daryl before this and he stole one of my top fives last week. And then he also took another one of my movies that I fell in like love with movies with because <laughs> I loved this movie growing up. <laughs> and it's funny you were talking about like getting the DVD because I don't know if you guys remember this, but do you remember when like DVDs came out and they had games in the menu and yes. you could like play in the menus mm-hmm. for like yes, hours yes. and there were different little like cut scenes and also I that one I remember distinctly playing in those menus forever so I'm sure I watched the commentary I you know I watched all sorts of things but um Monster Zinc was one of those ones that I just like fell in love with the animation it was like before they had Elsa with the hair and tangled with the hair Sully's hair is so gorgeous to look at (laughs) and he just looks so fluffy and I want to cuddle him and to me that like as a kid growing up I think it came out in 2001 right 2001 yeah 2001 so like I was like what six five I don't even know yeah no six but you know it's like to me that's just like it was a movie that the colors were gorgeous the you know the characters are just great they're so funny and it was one of those ones that like grew up with you too because then you know Monsters University came out right when we were all going to college yeah. and and I remember just like enjoying that one for what it was worth because I just had so much fun revisiting those characters. I love Mike Wazowski and I love Sully. Like they're just so classic and you can't go wrong with Billy Crystal. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Monsters Inc. was like one of the first kids movies that I remember, kids movies, that I remember my parents absolutely loving. Like, you know, like really there are just so many movies that like you drag your kids to because they want to see it because they saw all the premieres on the front of their VHSs and stuff. And like, you know, it's like kids movie after kids movie. But like we watched Monsters Inc. so many times because like you know, Pixar really just changed that. And I mean, you know, Toy Story was out. There were some other ones, but like Monsters, Inc. was like my parents' favorite cartoon movie (laughs) for a really long time. Oh my God. Random fact. Just found this one out. I was looking through (laughs) the um, the IMDb. Guess who plays Celia? Mike Wazowski's girlfriend? Huh. Um... Jennifer Tilly. Okay, yeah, yeah. I recognized the purpose. I was like, I know who this okay, is. Okay. For people who don't know, Jennifer Tilly plays the bride of Chucky. So <laughs> <laughs> I 
I was just really excited about that. <laughs> That's it's a Tiffany. Good one. It's Tiffany. But yeah, I was that was one I just I just saw and I was like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and also it's just the clever writing. Like it it's fun. Like it was yeah. something that didn't take itself seriously and but it also was a clever concept. It was when Disney was doing all those like new agey you know animations kind of thing like they had already done you know not toy story because that's pixar but you know well i guess this is a pixar film yeah yeah they're both pixar so it was kind of like they were experimenting with new styles with like watercolor and you know with regular animation and hand-drawn versus computer because i'm pretty sure 2001 was around the same time as lilo and stitch yeah and like that was like one of those ones where it had like the watercolor backgrounds and it was really gorgeous and if you look at monsters inc it has that kind of same texture and i really like that mm -hmm. yeah it was definitely a time period of great change at a uh, disney and pixar where they're just experimenting with different types of animation uh because like another film from that time would be like treasure planet was like a very huge influence on me mm -hmm. and it was you know of course really well known at the time for having you know hand-drawn animation but also lots of cgi kind of the first time it was really put together in that way it was a little janky <laughs> yeah and nobody really to do with it, but i loved it all the same I feel like Treasure Planet and Atlantis are like those two Disney movies that everyone sleeps yeah. on and I keep mentioning because I love them so much. Yeah. I feel like we've gotten to that point where everyone is like, wait a second, these two are actually good. How did we forget <laughs> and make them fail at the box office? How dare we? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was like my first movie that I could, that was, that I could remember. The second one was, and... <laughs> This, the second movie has nothing to do with the next two movies after that. Was Spy Kids 2, Island of Lost Dreams. <laughs> that one is so good, though. <laughs> that oh, was Spy movie. Kid movies are good. I, I, was, I, I was in love with those films. So much so that it was the first movie that made me think, I want to work in movies as an actor i really wanted to be an actor when i when i after i saw that movie because i was like this just looks so fun to work in this looks so so fun like you get to go on a set and get to see all cool kinds of cool weird creatures and stuff and like if you go like you can still go to school but you go to school on set like that was another one where the special features was a really big thing for me um watch those over and over and over again and i just thought this is the coolest job in the world i want to do that uh, nowadays I have no desire at all for acting um, I do I I enjoyed it in college but it's like I can't <laughs> I don't want to act in front of people with their actual stakes like oh you're paying me I can't do that <laughs> but yeah that was a big one Robert Rodriguez is like <laughs> the most random director in the world for me and I, I just love how he can go from this and also do like Sin City <laughs> where that recording just being <laughs> shot to death so, so good, I love that versatility <laughs> and I love him for inspiring my love for movies in a weird way I love the uh, Spy Kids oh, is that a trilogy there are technically four but at the time it was a trilogy it was a holy <laughs> trinity back then <laughs> okay I don't remember the fourth one but I don't remember I re it either I remember what, this is the third one and it's there in the video game it was like ready player yeah. one before ready player one <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um oh it was in 3d too do you remember mm -hmm. yeah when 3d oh, well, was remember. like really cool <laughs> and he would like push out the pixels and they'd come out oh. at you but like and then you're watching it and suddenly there's like ricardo montalban in it and it's like oh my god uh, <laughs> i remember yeah. even as a kid knowing exactly who that was and being like that's the guy from star trek to me that was con <laughs> so like that was like end over and my dad'd be like oh that that's the guy from he's con <laughs> so yeah spy kids is one of those like i wanted to definitely like jump into that world like i mean they micro 
microwaved the McDonald's. Oh and yeah. It, like popped up. Oh. That's so cool. And then you have Machete, who mm-hmm. is another actor that I just <laughs> enjoy watching. And like you go from that to watching his other stuff and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> but it's like technically I think I think it's like all in the same universe too. And that's like mm-hmm. the awesome thing about it. I mm-hmm. Like it's Danny so, Trejo, by it's the way. so dumb, but I love it. <laughs> and I'd like to remind you all that George Clooney was in Spy Kids as well, because of oh, course yeah. he was. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. my god, I forgot he was the uh, the president, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he, he was. Uh, when he had the bar <laughs> over his eye and he just took the bar off. <laughs> So oh funny. my god i think sylvester stallone was in it too actually sylvester i think there stallone was like is in the uh third one as well oh and steve buscemi's in the second one i know like with I that forgot perfect about line that. where he's like you think god stays in heaven because he's afraid of his own creation it's like what kind of line is that <laughs> for a children's film what does that even mean <laughs> it's like jesus okay. I always wanted here. like the little like the little tiny dinosaur thing like I wanted one of those so <laughs> to here. be honest all of those kind of like blend together for me but what I remember most is like going to see Spy Kids 3D in the theaters with my dad and he left that movie so angry not only because he hated it so much but also because he can only see out of one of his eyes so he just watched the whole movie Aww. in red <laughs> because he had to wear 3D glasses I can picture Mr. Chris being so angry <laughs> I thought you were going to say because Ricardo Montalban flew off after the butterfly at the end of the movie no. <laughs> this like beautiful monologue about what's real and like living life yes and to the fullest because he's in a wheelchair in real life but like and he's he can run around and be crazy and i think sylvester stallone's the bad guy in that one yeah he's like the twist reveal bad yeah. guy or something <laughs> yeah I think he's like, like no i'm actually the president or something <laughs> yeah yeah and he's like glitch 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 so pretty good <laughs> yeah we we should do a, a trilogy rewatch just to make I would sure be that it's totally about that it. it's good still <laughs> i remember there's the scene at the very beginning of one of them i don't know which one it is where the like president's daughter or something is trapped on one of the roller coasters and it's like yes. the one that like drops them that's the, the third editing one, in that scene is so cool and i and it's so robert rodriguez because of the like I think it has to be the third one because I'm picturing it in 3D. Yeah, but it like I think drops it is. down and it's I love when you can watch a movie and you go, oh yeah, that's Robert Rodriguez. And yeah. but it doesn't take you out of the film. And I like that. Yeah, definitely a, a big influence in <laughs> in the weirdest way. Just because he he left his movies have left him with so many memories, just of like this weirdness. So I appreciate that about him a lot um so yeah that's my number two and my number three is inception <laughs> so Whoa. completely different direction uh from from uh, spy kids too but i think inception was the one where i like seriously considered a career in film because it was the one it was the first movie I ever saw that i considered it as art i was like oh this is more than just coming up with a story and filming it there are a lot of like really meaty concepts in here. There's lots of like cool special effects that service the story. They, don't, they just exist for the sake of existing. And it was also one of the first movies. I think it's the first one I can remember going to go see by myself. I think before that I'd seen movies with my parents or my friends. That one went completely by myself because I was like, this trailer is cool. I want to go see it. And just being blown away by the artistry at hand it like it completely changed my perspective of movies it just made me think i gotta watch more i need to see more i need to understand more about film because i think that was the year before i ever took my first film class where i really had my my true appreciation of film like really really started but inception was like well you know the inception of my my love for movies and I just I just love it it's how I it, it's how I changed my approach to making like little short films I was like no now that I know there's actual like thought that has to go into this it's not just film whatever it's film with intention so that was a big one for me the biggest I'm so one jealous <laughs> that you got to see it in the theaters because I didn't see it in theaters Oh. And I was really hoping in 2020, we'd get like a 10 year anniversary kind of thing. So I'm hoping, here's hoping for 15 years, they'll do like a 
think because I'd love to watch that. I didn't get to watch that until, and I don't say I didn't get to, I'm sure I chose not to watch it until later in life. I think I watched it in college for the first time. And I'm trying to think what class, I think it was for digital cinema or one of the film criticism Mm. or something like that. And I had to watch it through the eye of something. And, um, and I remember just being like, dang it. Like I could have seen this in theaters, you know? (laughs) And I remember just being like, so mad at myself because I remember just being so engrossed with the filmmaking and just the even just storytelling like if you take out the filmmaking part the story is so complex and I remember watching that and going like oh wow (laughs) (laughs) oh it's got some great moments too some of the scenes like even just like the last shot Ah, is so beautiful it's so it's so perfect it's so perfect (laughs) so good definitely need to rewatch that one because I'm pretty sure that I've only seen it once Ah. all the way through but yeah I I need to give that one a rewatch and it's on my poster (laughs) Ah, I would rewatch that one with you because that one is one I enjoy watching whenever and it's a long movie but (laughs) I will watch that one and I'm not afraid of long movies (laughs) I listed 2001 (laughs) last week for fun I think yeah. a lot of us have a couple of long movies on here, but like Inception, even the music is mm-hmm. just so purposeful and so yeah. beautiful. And, and I think it's the first time you watch Leonardo DiCaprio. And like, in my mind as an adult, it's the first time I see him in like mm. a serious movie, I guess. Like, I know he's done a bunch of other movies, like, but in my mind, I still see him as little kid from Titanic yeah yeah him in inception and it's this totally different concept and I maybe I just didn't watch a lot of movies in his career and now he has a family he wants to get back to but he can't because he broke the law by going in people's dreams basically (laughs) so (laughs) who's the woman in it I can't remember what her name Uh, is Marion Cotillard I think it's I don't know how you pronounce her name I'm probably butchering it but she is so she's great she's she's such a great actress (laughs) she's art on screen and i think it's because she looks like an old school actress like she She does a french you know like film noir you know femme fatale kind of things and and maybe it's the movie that paints her that way but because that's really what she is yeah that's the whole point you know and so it's oh and she just lures you in and you're mm. like who cares <laughs> it's okay <laughs> jump right in <laughs> and it's superstar studied too like tom hardy joseph gordon levitt elliot page like there's all sorts of different just varieties of actors and there's uh-huh. just different levels and it it almost brings this like complexity to not only the dynamic of the film but it adds these layers to characters and story that they're just all so likable yeah it's probably honestly it's probably no one's best cast film in a sense because they have such a good chemistry and a lot of his other films he doesn't really focus too much on like make sure the cast all work together it's more like i need faces i need people who can act i need you to say these lines <laughs> they all do good performances but they don't mesh as well as they do in inception inception really feels like a true ensemble cast you know that's so weird i never considered it as an ensemble movie because like you know you think of oceans 8 oceans 11 like all the billion ocean movies and Mm. i never go oh yeah inception's a great ensemble cast but now that you point it out it's that's what it is yeah it's a high school (laughs) it's a high school ensemble film yeah and it's gorgeous and oh my god i just remember killian murphy's in it yeah (laughs) i just like had like a brain panic because i was like oh my god (laughs) another another actor i just love to watch anything he's in if you haven't seen peaky blinders definitely check that out he's so good in that and um so for my last film i'm sorry that i have four i just i just love talking about movies this one's very it's gonna be short though is eight and a half by federico fellini um so this is a 1963 film it is the i think if i remember correctly the first foreign film i ever saw and i guess by proxy it's also the most important one to me it's definitely like probably one of my all-time favorites but it was the one that made me think 
oh wow there's a whole nother realm of movies i just haven't seen and it's the story is basically about a director who has had success and has basically made eight movies uh well actually federico Fellini, the director made eight movies and he called this one this eight and a half film because he didn't know what to make the movie about and that's what the movie's about it's about a director who doesn't know what to make their movie about and he's like in the middle of production he's like i don't i got these sets i got these actors i don't i don't know what this is what's supposed to happen <laughs> and it's really interesting and i really resonate i feel like the main character resonates with me this feeling of like confusion and kind of anxiety despite living in like this kind of star-studded world of you know glitz and glamour he's kind of like i don't know what i'm doing and i really appreciated that it's something that really resonated with me at the time and still kind of does now but as a as a foreign film it was just kind of magical to me because i was like i've never seen this perspective before and this is so cool and so i started watching some more after that i have no comment on that i've never seen it and i kind of <laughs> really want to. i was I've trying to think of, of the first foreign film i had ever seen I feel like the first time I remember like reading subtitles through a movie was um, Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and now um, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro is probably my first foreign film because I, I watched a lot of his horror stuff, which is uh, like the orphanage and things like that, which are super scary. Yeah, his early ones are in <laughs> kidding, Spanish. Kidding, kidding, please watch. Oh my God, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's kind of funny because it's like, I feel like I was surprised. I was like, I can't think of any other foreign film, but it's like Eight and a Half has always been like the, the first one that pops into my head. And I saw that one also when I was in high school, probably after I started my film class. <laughs> um, so it's like Inception, film class, then foreign movies after that. So I guess it's a nice little progression of yeah. learning about new stuff. But y'all should see it. Um, it's the I've only seen two Fellini films, and I like this one a lot more than uh, the other one I've seen. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm definitely not an expert on this particular director, but I love this movie so much. <laughs> so yeah, those are all my movies. Those are the ones that made me fall in love with movies. All I right. love that line, the movie yeah. that made you fall in love with movies. Cause like I, my dad was asking me, oh, what's this week's topic? And I was like, oh, it's the movie that made you fall in love with movies. And he was like, I don't even know where to start with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, imagine having to talk about it for an hour. <laughs> oh, well, on that, I had to really think about this one. And this one was hard for me because I was trying not to repeat off of last week's stuff because like, my mom was like, oh, well, obviously Wizard of Oz. And I was like, well, yeah, it was the first film like I remember sitting down watching and being engrossed with. But I was trying to think of like another film when I was a kid and growing up that like made me fall in love with storytelling and artwork and just watching movies. And I, I had to do kind of like a, okay, favorite movies <laughs> and I had to like go do, 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 do. <laughs> and I came up with Mary Poppins and it was one that I was surprised to really like think about and I was like oh well yeah I loved Mary Poppins and it was because I love well one I love Dick Van Dyke and I can watch him in anything and I love his acting and I love his dancing and I just everything about him is just a joy but I love the jumping in to the other world and to the painting part. I love mm -hmm. watching him like draw on the chalk and then jumping into that. And to me, it's one of those films that like it has something for everybody. And it is that perfect balance of like highs and lows because like even like the feeding the bird scene is so low, but like to this day, I know like every line to that song <laughs> and like I love that song. And I don't know. It's just one of those that I, I mean, like the mom's a suffragette, like the, you know, dad's an angry banker, you know, <sighs> the whole thing is just a beautiful, like mesh of colorful characters and vibrant, you know, actors. And I mean, Dick Van Dyke plays not only Bert, but also the like old banker as well, who's like takes the coin away from the guy and tells him to invest. And, you know, like to me, like that's, I remember going like, man, no, I don't want to invest. I want to 
pay, you know, I want to <laughs> buy something with it. And it, it just is one of those films that even to this day, like I can remember watching and being like, oh my God, I want to dance with the penguins. <laughs> like I just want to go dance with the little penguins and them doing all the, and then the merry ground. I love that. The whole scene is great. Yeah, that's, that's one of those films that I, I, I'm sorry to say I've never seen. But all my friends who have seen it, they're just like, I love it so much. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. It just made me feel so good as a kid. And I'm like, yeah, I wish I saw that. <laughs> that sounds nice. <laughs> but I'm glad, I don't know, it's, it's cool that, like, I don't know, it's one of those films where the cool thing about it is, you know, the, the live action and the animated part. Like, I always thought that was a cool thing, even though I'd never seen it. Because, I mean, Roger Rabbit was, of course, like, yeah. the natural evolution of that but it doesn't fit in the same way that like a Mary Poppins does. And I just, I think, I guess of all those movies, that one seems to have done it the best at the time. Oh. So there's like Peach Dragon and stuff like that. But Bed I don't Knobs know. and Broomsticks is another one that's really good. I was okay. thinking about that one. As I was talking about Mary Poppins, I was like, oh my God, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. There's a <laughs> scene where they play like soccer or foot it's like a rugby soccer thing uh-huh. and it's like these cartoon people and it's and it's the guy running around the field trying to like <laughs> play with them it's so funny oh my gosh it's just one of those things like it perfectly blends cartoons for kids but also the other storyline for adults but to me I never saw there was a difference like to me it was perfectly a blend mm-hmm hmm. I actually it watched happens. the um what's that movie they did not too long ago like about Mary Poppins Saving, like, Mr. Oh, Banks. Saving Mr. Banks yeah I watched yes. that like a few months ago and that was really fun oh that one's heart-wrenching yeah it I is love that movie. <laughs> I love that you've seen the movie about this movie but not the movie yeah. itself <laughs> yeah, I was like why would I actually watch the movie I, I don't know why I don't watch it uh, <laughs> it's interesting because that movie makes you see Mary Poppins in a different point of view about like growing up you're always like oh it's about Julie Andrews's character Mm -hmm. Mary Poppins and you know it's about how she's a wonderful like you know nanny and she's perfect but in actuality and and saving Mr. Banks they really talk about it it's about the father and the Mm -hmm. family and grow like you know creating a family unit that works together and to me it's kind of cool to watch it now as an adult and going like yeah that makes sense you know like this is a man that needs a wake-up call and this nanny is wonderful and makes things move around and the scene where she's making everything clean up itself it's so good and I just remember being like oh I wish I could do that with a snap of a finger you know (laughs) it's just one of those films that like I think you can revisit no matter what and you'll get something new out of it mm-hmm. isn't that cool when you watch a movie and then you watch it again much later and you can have like a completely different understanding of the film that's awesome i love that yeah <laughs> i'm interested yeah. to, I, i'm interested to see what you would think about it daryl because like i'm wondering like if you would think it would be boring or because it does move pretty slow like for a kid's movie it moves pretty slow i think mm-hmm. it has a weird it's not a three-act structure per se but it's almost a three-act structure so it's kind of a it's just long for a kid's movie I guess I don't know it'll be yeah. interesting to know what you think about it oh, well I'll give any movie a shot as long as somebody tells me it's good I guess <laughs> I mean did you see uh alone. returns yes I did I did uh, is it worth watching <laughs> There are scenes in it that are really good. And I like okay. Lin-Manuel Miranda. So anything with mm, him in it yeah. and Emily Blunt. Blunt. Yeah, yeah, I love watching her act. So I enjoyed it for what it's worth, which was a sequel for a movie that probably didn't need a sequel. But yeah. I was okay with that. Like I went to it and I was like, it has the aspects I want. And, you know, oh, I just thought of another scene. <laughs> <laughs> The scene where they're on the ceiling and they're laughing is the best. Oh my gosh, the it's what's the song? Do you remember Sarah? No. You don't remember it? I don't it's it they're basically like they can't stop laughing and it makes them 
turn upside down and like have tea on the ceiling I can definitely and, picture it but I don't remember and, he, the and then he started like <laughs> laughing so hard he's crying so me I was like that was gonna be me like that's how much I want to enjoy life <laughs> you know always <laughs> laugh so hard it puts me on the ceiling so I don't know yeah on um, next so that was like I guess my first film that like made me like go okay film is an art form that I love to watch and enjoy and then I saw Psycho (laughs) (laughs) right Um, after (laughs) same genre right after (laughs) same genre right after I was a four-year-old no I'm kidding (laughs) Um, but that was another film that I saw and I was like I was at the edge of my seat the whole time and it was one of those films that it made me want to make films. Mm. And because I knew like, you know, as I'm watching it, I'm sure either my mom or my dad is telling me like, oh, well that's chocolate syrup in the shower, you know, (laughs) like, and so there are like tidbits that I'm hearing and I'm learning about this movie and I'm like, I want to make a movie like this. And, you know, and I'm pretty sure I did make movies like that. I'm pretty sure I used chocolate (laughs) syrup in a zombie film and I, you know, (laughs) dyed it red to make it look like a dark red. You know, I'm sure I did something like that. But like, it was a film that had suspense and it introduced me to Hitchcock, which is one of my favorite directors of all time. I love anything Hitchcock and even his more obscure ones. Like I can... Anything he touched his hands on, I'll consume with enthusiasm and be 100% okay with it. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, like Psycho is just a film that I wasn't expecting to like because it does start off super slow and it, it changes. And, you know, I learned that you don't have to, you know, have a movie that follows the same beginning middle and end it can change halfway through a story and become a totally different movie like Mm -hmm. I remember being like awestruck that the main character spoiler alert main character just dies halfway through the film and then there's another main character like suddenly you have to follow a different protagonist and you have to like learn to understand like oh we have to follow the sister like (laughs) what (laughs) you know and that Anthony Perkins is just the perfect villain. Like, I mean, that was Hannibal Lecter before you got Hannibal Lecter, basically. You know, like, oh, I haven't seen that in forever. Now I kind of want to watch it. Psycho <laughs> <laughs> um, was such I, a. F- oh, go ahead. Uh, I actually, I didn't, I didn't see it until college, so that was like a a later viewing for me but like I was obsessed with it like after I finished watching it I was like that was so good and I like wanted to immediately watch it again because like it was crazy just how like it grabs you like that and like it's beautiful and it just it holds up it's amazing I love it that movie is so interesting to me because I had a very different experience than most people do with that film I feel like I wasn't sure like is this very commonplace but everyone I've talked to has not had this experience for me I watched the movie and thought wow that was really cool I knew exactly what was going to happen though because it's so pervasive in pop culture it kind of like made it harder for me to like it at the time and I was like that's so strange like what age did you see it I probably saw it when I was, I think I saw it when I was in high school. So at the time I was just like, yeah, like everything, I knew everything about that movie, except that the, uh, the protagonist changed halfway through what I thought was really cool. That is, that is still something where I'm like, I, it's hard to think of a movie that's done that really well since, but I can name a couple, (laughs) (laughs) but it's just a, it's just a fascinating thing for me. Cause I remember liking it, but I was like, man, I wish I didn't know what was going to happen. I remember reading articles later on, like years later, about people who like saw it for the first time were like, oh my God, what is this? This is, this is insane. And people were afraid to shower for ages. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one of the like, so Ross and I have been dating for since we were kids in high school. And I remember watching it at his house and his grandmother coming in and her, his grandmother going, 
oh no, I can't watch this. Like, cause <laughs> it's, like it, it's the shower scene. And she's like, mm -mm, I couldn't take a shower for years after that. Like it, like people just like stopped taking showers, took a bath. Like they were like, we're good. <laughs> and I, I just remember being so entranced with that film and just the monologues are so good. And then it starts off as a heist film moment, almost then it becomes a chase film. And then it becomes a horror film. <laughs> like it's like never stays in one genre. Going along in the same vein as Psycho, I actually am now realizing that all my films are like 60s and 50s. I'm trying to remember when Mary Poppins came out, but I have another 50s movie. Oh, 64. So yeah, I'm literally going <laughs> back in time with my films. So I had the luxury of being able to take a screenwriting class when I was in high school. And I remember studying film for the first time and like being able to like watch something and articulate what's going on and you know, how to write that. And the first script I ever read, and I, I tend to read scripts when I really like films. <laughs> which is a really weird thing to do, but I no, have a I couple of scripts. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I know Daryl gets it. So. <laughs> but um, the first script I ever read, like cover to cover was On the Waterfront, Ilya Kazan's movie uh, with Marlon Brando. And I remember watching that and it being an eye-opening moment for me and going, because I mean, aside from you know, the big ones like Mary Poppins, Psycho, you know, Bednums and Brucex. I hadn't really watched a lot of older movies, I guess. And for me, watching On the Waterfront was this moment of, this is how you write dialogue. <laughs> and this is how you write story because you can't rely on fancy effects and you can't rely on fancy cuts. You have to rely on reaction shots and which I learned a fascinating fact about reaction shots in this film. Um, and it's interesting, it, did it win for best story? I don't think it won for best story or best, you know, it did win for best screenplay that year. Cause I went and looked it up. I wanted to know like, it won like eight Oscars that yeah, year. Yeah, it was a big winner. <laughs> yeah, but um, it was one of those movies that like Marlon Brando was like, enticed to do like they had talked about giving it to another up and coming star and Marlon Brando was like no give it to me it's mine and and then he was a real you know ass the rest of the making of the film I found out like the big scene that he does which is like the monologue where he's like I could have been a contender like yeah. this beautiful moment he only shot his scenes and then booked it it was like, I'm good. So the poor guy who has to do all the reaction shots didn't get to react to Marlon Brando doing the monologue. Get to react to some schmo. Like, you know, like it sucks. Like, or it would be really cool to be like, yeah, I, you know, my grandfather was the guy that read the monologue for On the Waterfront to the guy reacting. I don't know. It's Marlon Brando left. And then, and then I apparently found out that the guy that was, they were saying they were going to give the uh, role to instead of Marlon Brando was Paul Newman really so I was like oh okay like another beautiful actor yeah I mean that totally just as much killed it <laughs> yeah but it to me Marlon Brando brings that extra grit Paul Newman is a little too um my he's a little too high strung to be mm -hmm. the character that Marlon Brando comes off as and it's a movie that I haven't seen in a while but it's it's got mobs and it's got fighting and it's got gun shooting and it's got save the girl and it's got all these like beautiful moments of love in its own ways and there's these moments of like community too that I think was the first time I had ever felt community in a movie oh okay so yeah that's fine it was the first time I ever studied a script <laughs> at New Orleans Center for Creative Arts no yeah <laughs> yeah i remember watching that movie and just thinking like these were four it was one of the, those movies i watched early on in my kind of film discovery where i was just like man every performance in here is just a knockout like i think about uh lee j cobb the, the mob boss like 
that actor, I was like, oh my God, this is such a cool, like, oh, it was one of those roles where I was like, this is like the juiciest role. I like, if I lived back then and racism wasn't a thing, I would have loved to have done that. I don't know what you're talking about, Daryl. You would have been a killer New York mob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, this is... Would have gone perfectly. It's just, but yeah, I just, I loved, I, I loved watching people act and just be in that movie. Mm -hmm. It was, it was an experience. <laughs> So Eva Marie Saint was actually like, this is like her big role. In my opinion, this is like the biggest one she has. I don't think I'm trying to, f I, I can't even find her on IMDb. She's like the last one on the list. Poor thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is her film. She's in North by Northwest, which I know is like, that's a big film. I get that. But yeah. like, no one goes, oh yeah. Eva Marie Saint and North by Northwest <laughs> they don't talk about her like that they you know this role that she got was supposed to go to Grace Kelly really she turned it down for rear window <laughs> oh what? that's so cool that's so like, interesting what <laughs> like to me that's like it would have been a totally different movie if Grace Kelly had been in on the waterfront and then like let's say they switch uh -huh. which could have happened it could have happened because she's in north by northwest so yeah like it could have been a thing but it would have been totally different in both ways like that's insane <laughs> yeah like grace kelly doesn't fit in the underground mobster world of and neither does you know even saint but like it's like still it's, <laughs> it would have been so different it would have been history would have been changed things wouldn't have happened wars <laughs> <laughs> she might not have gotten married to the you know prince of monaco we might not have you know the tragic history of grace kelly if she hadn't have been in rear window i don't know for anybody who doesn't know me i was named after grace kelly so i have a love for her and all things grace kelly so and i would have probably loved the movie even more if she was in it <laughs> But yeah, so those are my three movies. I kept it simple. I had another couple on there, like Moulin Rouge, which made me fall in love with editing. I had thought about Inception, but I was like, no, wait, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. All right. Finale. All right. Last but not least, I guess. I mean, well, at least not in my opinion, but um, so most all right. Important. <laughs> most importantly. <laughs> So, um, I remember like going to the movies when I was a kid and like, so wanting to be in those worlds and like, you know, just really getting sucked into it, being at the theater, like you want to just jump into that movie, be with those characters. But when I saw Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl in 2003, I was nine years old and I did not want to be a pirate. I wanted to make movies like I watched that movie and I was like I want to do that and it just like spurred this whole thing for me and like I told my mom and I think she totally understood it because she was like I felt the same way when I saw the first Indiana Jones movie so yeah she uh she told my uncle that I was into to movie making he bought me this little blue camcorder that took these really terrible tapes and I started trying to make movies um but yeah I just still Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl is still one of my favorite movies of all time I think it's like without fault the action is so good it is so quotable like the story is amazing the characters are awesome like I love every minute of that movie so it's probably the best movie ever made after a theme park ride for sure <laughs> right <laughs> yeah definitely definitely no, I, would, I mean you didn't see the haunted that. mansion with eddie murphy are you telling me that wasn't <laughs> it's a the good one movie? or tomorrowland <laughs> tomorrowland i don't even remember who was in that george clooney oh yeah george clooney yeah there yeah. we go the president of the back. united states yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that folks was called a callback we play in that exactly. <laughs> all connected here it's like a marvel movie <laughs> have you seen the tiktok where it's like someone realizes something that's going on in the marvel movie? <laughs> oh my gosh uh, i yeah, I, grew, I grew up watching those that was actually my first pg-13 movie i ever saw 
in really? theaters. I remember seeing that and my mom going, now this is going to be scary. And I remember seeing, you know, Barbosa turn into the skeleton, into skeleton. For the <laughs> first time <laughs> is bone chilling oh. and it's so good and the scene where they're all the wine walking, oh it's so good oh the wine oh yeah <laughs> it the whole thing is just chilling and then you have you know johnny depp who i'm sure like most of us weren't introduced like i know people knew johnny depp before then but like as in our age group johnny depp that was like the first time we ever met him and um I just remember I was like in love with him growing up. I I yeah. remember one of my first trips to Disney World. I would take every picture I could with Johnny Depp on like posters. <laughs> like I would take pictures of like, you know, his costume and like, you know, the great movie you're in and things like that. But um, it was one of those films that I see. I wanted to be a pirate. Like I always, <laughs> want, I grew up always wanting to be a pirate. Me and my cousins used to play pirates all the time. And to me, that was like the first movie where I was like, yeah, I could be a pirate. <laughs> it had Zoe Zeldana in it. And you're like, oh my God, she's a badass pirate. And then, you know, 20 years later, you're like, oh my God, this is one of the leaders in the Marvel movie. <laughs> and she's this like sweet little thing. And she's so young. But yeah, I, oh. And it's quippy. The script's really good. I, I was so like true. thinking about scenes and I was like oh yeah and it's got so many quotable moments like the whole series does it really does like you know but why is the rum gone like, <laughs> there's things I, that we say I'm pretty sure I said that the other day to Ross <laughs> <laughs> I was like but why is the rum gone I don't even drink rum <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only that's the only movie in the franchise that I actually kind of remember the plot to I completely for, I've seen every all like the main trilogy like multiple times I cannot mm-hmm. remember what they're about except the first one because <laughs> it's got some skeletons in it and I was a big fan of those skeletons when I was a kid I was like they're rad it's really cool here look at the just bones up. walking around it, yeah the CGI holds up really well in, it does. in all of the films I remember yes. seeing um the second one with Davy Jones and you have Bill Nye and I remember watching like some of the, like the special features for that one and watching him act and he has all the dots over his face. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, his lips are moving the same way that he actually moves. And I remember like seeing Bill Nye and something else and going, oh my God, like he, like Davy Jones is him. Yeah. Like, it's mm-hmm. not like they just put him for the words. Like they use facial, like, I just, I like Pirates of the Caribbean though. Like I like anything with pirates. <laughs> So, yeah. Like, even guilty pleasure will watch the fourth one. Uh, uh, who and is the it? Fifth one. <laughs> oh, I forgot. There's a fifth one. It never ends. It never Which will really end. Sure. <laughs> yes, there is a fifth one. Yeah. yeah it's, They're talking it's, about it's, doing another one. Dead Men yeah. Tell No Tales, I think, is the fifth one. Yeah, they're gonna have a female protagonist for the new. Like, I don't know if they're doing a new series or what, but yeah, I think they're they're taking control of the redhead from the ride and turning her into <laughs> more than a, a redhead <laughs> yeah <laughs> <on> the ride <laughs> maybe they'll switch I, uh, roles like I, 007 basically oh <laughs> you're the new jack sparrow <laughs> <laughs> And and Jack Sparrow is one of those like anti protagonists too. Like you don't want to root for him because you know he's a bad guy, but he's a good guy in his own story. So that's all that matters is we're gonna root for him. That's another thing. And then he turns out to being a good guy the whole time, and he was a pirate because people are crap. Yeah, because he didn't want to sell children into slavery or something. It's like, oh, you're cool. I like this guy. The thing is, is that uh, those movies aren't about Jack. Well, it kind of turned into about Jack, (laughs) but that first movie is not Jack's movie. That movie's about Will Turner. Will Turner, yeah. And he just steals it from him. Like, (laughs) Johnny Jeb just stole that movie and ran with it because, I mean, yeah, Will's great. Elizabeth is great. Everyone is great. Norrington, like all of them. Oh, I love the actor who plays Barbosa is like, oh, so good. But- yeah that that movie's supposed to be about will and it's not about will no yeah johnny forgot. depp steals that show and like i think it's because they give johnny depp the serious moments in that film like mm-hmm. 
Will Turner is like this goofy protagonist that like, you know, yeah, he knows how to sword fight, but that's it. You know, he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know anything else. But like Johnny Depp is like, he has the moments about like, you know, when he salutes all the pirates that are hung. Like I remember getting (laughs) chills from that because I'm like, dang, like that's scary. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when I like really started watching behind the scenes stuff. I watched it for every single one of the movies. I still have the like dual disc DVDs, even though (laughs) they're in SD and look (laughs) terrible, but I I have my collection. And um, yeah, I absolutely love that movie. Okay, so for my second movie, and I only have two to really talk about, um, is The Nightmare Before Christmas, 1993. Uh, it came out actually like a week before I was born for Halloween and it was like the highest grossing movie at that time but anyway um, yeah so my love for The Nightmare Before Christmas was very much like it was for a lot of other people in high school with their hot topic phase like yeah it was a big part of my goth girl phase but also it got me so obsessed with stop motion and claymation and all of it so um I think that was like one of the first times I like really wanted to like see more about that process and like it was just so foreign to me and it was like so intriguing so like I bought a bunch of clay and I tried to make like my own little stop motion film with like this black cat walking around and realized that it was way harder than I thought it was going to be <laughs> and gave up like 10 percent of the way through <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I just I I really really dove deep into like that um behind the scenes footage kind of things and like then I got really into Corpse Bride when that one came out uh-huh. and that one like blew my mind I watched it like I think four times in one day <laughs> because like I just couldn't <laughs> stop watching that movie and I like watched all the behind the scenes and like the way they like painstakingly animated everything like even the butterfly in the opening scene is made out of clay and then they put it in with like green screen afterwards but like still it's claymation like all of it was just so like crazy to me and I just love the artistry behind it and like it kind of opened up like my inner artist I guess Mm. that's awesome (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome like that's that movie is I think of that kind of like series of movies like that of, in that stop motion. That was one of the last ones I saw before like my college phase. It took me forever. I wanted to see it so badly and I couldn't find it anywhere where I was from. I was like, I was so mad. And I finally got to see one day and I was like, yes, it has happened. I have seen <laughs> A Nightmare Before Christmas and it is glorious. <laughs> oh man. I too had a stop motion phase though. I think mine was brought on by uh, Wallace and Gromit though <laughs> oh that's so <laughs> good <laughs> I think Me I too. helped you with a stop motion thing we did like a little stop motion with the um a slider Daryl do you remember that yes <laughs> the, yes the little action figure thing yeah that's right I forgot Wars. we did that now a year and a half ago that was about, that. yeah that was a while ago <laughs> yeah so I did end up making a stop motion kind of thing it was like 10 <laughs> seconds but i did it i did yeah it. he made it and then it sat in an editing bay for six months until i got there <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah and nothing happened to it <laughs> yeah, no nope. and oh, i didn't really have a nightmare before christmas phase surprisingly which i think is funny and my sister was more into it than i was and that was probably why i just was like oh sisters you know (laughs) it was one of those movies that i learned to love as i got older i think Mm -hmm. because to me halloween was always like the spooky and the scary stuff but this was always a christmas movie to me which i think is funny like to me that's like i watched it at christmas because to me, it's like, it's wholehearted and it's super lovey-dovey. And to me, like, I'm like, oh yeah, skeletons at Christmas makes total sense. Like, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I never really went through a stop motion phase and I, I'm trying to think back on it. And I, 
I probably liked Corpse Bride. That was probably one of my favorites. I really liked Frankenweenie. I don't know oh, if that one that was, was even fun. considered stop motion, but his like oh, it was a thing. Was. There was two. There was like a short film Frankenweenie that was mostly yes. live action with yeah, that was, was live, live action. action. And then that yeah, one was all did. live action. That was his first one, and it was yeah. his only movie he ever did with Disney before he was fired yeah. or let go yeah. or whatever. Tim Burton. And then was they did talking the... about here. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. <laughs> but yeah, he worked for Disney for like a brief, very brief. I think early on in his career, mm-hmm. and then. Yeah, he, he was an animator. Didn't agree. Then. Yeah, he worked. I can't on remember what Tron. <laughs> Tron, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, I didn't know I think, that. I think. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to quote anything. I know he worked on some of the like classic. Uh, yeah, animated say, was it movies Black too? Children or something like that, which I, I, I turned know. on. I feel like anything that I want to say is too old. Like I think it was Fox and the Hound, but that feels way too old for Tim Burton to have worked on. <laughs> So oh, I'm not really not. sure. Now I gotta know. Now no, I, I don't even know game. what year that came out. But <laughs> he did Pee Wee Herman. I forget about Pee Wee Herman. Mm. Fox and the Hound was 1981. Okay. Tron. Oh, wow. I thought it was a lot older than that. And the Black Cauldron. I was Very right. Nice. With that, I love the Black Cauldron. <laughs> I, I, I love the Black Cauldron. My mom that pulled that villain one scared up. the crap out of me. Same. <laughs> the scene where like his skin rips off. Oh, oh God, my God, I love that. It's so good. My mom put it on the other night, and I was like, I have to go to bed. I can't stay up and watch this because, like, I was like, I forget there was a pig in it, and the pig can see the future, and it's so cute, <laughs> and the little so animation of the pig. But then it was one of those films that like they reused a lot of animation because yeah. you can see like sort of the stone was used for that peter pan was used for that. there's a lot okay. of like repeats of that yeah. one it might be why i thought it was so much older than the 80s yeah because yeah, it kind of technically is. feel that much <laughs> that's interesting so he is an uncredited conceptual artist for the horned king hmm. really so he probably <laughs> got so cool. fired before he uh he could finish that so that's interesting and now everything he makes is under disney so yeah Yeah, he came came crawling back to me (laughs) (laughs) so after i found um the night before christmas i kind of went on like this whole tim burton kick and like i watched every single thing that came out even like that terrible movie remake of dark shadows and like all of it but um (laughs) Alice in Wonderland, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland from 2010 that came out like... Oh my god, I forgot about that one. Yeah, oh, yeah. Don't even remind me of that movie. <laughs> oh, I know. It's so bad. <laughs> it came out right at the beginning of um, high school. I think it was in like ninth grade and um, I like absolutely love that movie so much. Like, I think I made like three different art projects for my art class that had to do with really? like that version of Alice in Wonderland. And I remember like recreating scenes from it with my cousins and like making them dress up like the <laughs> Queen of Hearts and Alice and like running around in my backyard and like filming stuff. Like, oh, it was so cringy and I lost it forever. Oh, oh my god because no one is ever seeing that <laughs> no <laughs> i'm a beetlejuice fan and hallie for uh oh, oh classic <laughs> wait which souls. one was nadia was she was, nadia she the... was the queen of hearts and hallie was alice because she's blonde <laughs> yeah that makes sense <laughs> i'm oh, a beetlejuice man. fan personally that's like my all-time favorite tim burton and nothing compares that film me i think <laughs> edward scissorhands is mine i absolutely adore edward scissorhands which is a christmas movie and i'll fight anyone who says it isn't well i guess we're just gonna sit here and ignore that sweeney todd exists but okay that's fine okay sweeney that's todd fine. is wait so good second. wait a second okay that's like on another level because that existed before tim burton <laughs> Like it doesn't count. It doesn't <laughs> it's count. Really <laughs> it's so good. Oh my god. I can watch that's another one. Like I'll watch and I'll be like singing along and I'm yeah. like, 
Yeah, I definitely watched that twice in the same day. I was like, oh, yes, this is perfect. (laughs) (laughs) I remember, Grace, you sent me like Johnny Depp was in some like band or whatever. And you're like, he has like an album out. And we're like listening to it. I was like, hey, this like isn't that bad or whatever. I didn't know he could sing. (laughs) And then we both like were like, wait, he was in (laughs) Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Sweeney Todd. (laughs) He sang for a whole movie. (laughs) Totally forgot he was in Sweeney Todd. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think his band is called like Hollywood Vampires or something. Like yeah, that. <laughs> I think it's like a bunch of actors and a band together. Um, uh, I but also, yeah, I went deep on on watching all of Johnny Depp stuff too. Like it was just all Tim Burton and Johnny Depp for like years. Like I watched Twenty One Jump Street, the show, uh, because Johnny Depp was in it. And like all of it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Personally, Nightmare on Elm Street is my favorite Johnny oh. Depp. <laughs> But I Come love on with that crop Depp, top. The, the crop yeah. top and the sweatpants. <laughs> and he has so like one of the best death scenes too. Like he does have a really good death into the that. bed. I love that. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. With the TV and everything. Mm-hmm. Like with his headphones on. They're like this big. <laughs> it's so good. They look like mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. But uh looks like that's all our films that we had there you only had two but i only had three so you're Nine, all four, the greatest <laughs> of all numbers <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um anything big happening right now in uh movie news not really <laughs> i mean like the biggest one for me is and it's not even because i want to see the movie just because i think it's so stupid <laughs> is a uh, zach snyder's justice league um yeah his finally the snyder cut which everybody has wanted for some reason for so long is finally coming out this week and uh yeah i'm just waiting to see if that's train wreck or not because <laughs> i don't know what to do about it it's just it's just dumb to me that it exists but also it's like how will this will this change the industry if it's a hit if it's good i don't know will like, directors get more say in what goes on in movies and things like that or yeah like the director's cuts become more you know prominent because yeah. like a lot of the time directors cut come out like at 10th anniversary editions and things like that yeah, yeah. and it's typically just like here's a, a couple new scenes and here's a, a re-edit this is like no there's no joss whedon footage because i don't like joss whedon anymore apparently he just doesn't like him anymore which apparently nobody does because that's a whole thing right now no. you listen to this far in the future this is a whole thing it's yeah. a whole thing <laughs> sweden's like totally not on a good list right now <laughs> yeah yeah so fair enough for Zack snyder but i am curious to see if like now that he's able to make the movie i guess he wanted to make Will that mean that studios think, oh, maybe we should let directors make the movies they want to make? Oh, <laughs> Crazy these thought. people are like good at their jobs. We should, yeah. you know, let them do what they need to do. Exactly. <laughs> Even if it is Zack Snyder, who is not like a favorite of mine in any way, but I respect that he has a vision and he wants to sell that vision. So, I mean, good for him, I guess. So I just I... want to see if it's going to be a train wreck or not. Though. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm not that excited for it because I haven't seen Justice League yet. <laughs> If you had no, seen you guys... Justice League, you probably still wouldn't be excited. Yeah, for you it, wouldn't so. remember it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm I watched not a big, it. I'm not a big Justice League fan. Like I'm Batman, and that's it. <laughs> and I like, you know, I like some of the Wonder Woman stuff, but that, you know, I'm Batman. Get me, get me anything Batman, and I'm fine. But I hate Superman, and I can't <laughs> really stand anything else. Uh, controversial and I opinions. Yes. <laughs> that's I'm also, that's me um i'm curious if like something like this would even happen if like quarantine wasn't going on like i feel mm-hmm. like honestly jack or zack snyder's probably okay with it just being like this hbo max release because like no one's going to the movies right now anyway yeah and, like he's not doing anything yeah being such a big thing like maybe director's cuts will be more common because like they don't have to go through a whole theatrical release and maybe lose money on it and mm. all that you know that's a very I'll be interested point. to see how much is different yeah because, like most director's cuts like you said daryl are like you know here's a couple extra scenes that we had to take out due to time restrictions mm-hmm. you know or like you know we took out this you know scene of dialogue because it was just didn't make sense for the plot of the movie or something uh and i'm like thinking like alien and aliens like blade in my runner. mind blade runner yeah and 
and I remember watching and being like, oh, what, what was the difference? You know, like not yeah. realizing there was a difference. But um, I'm interested to see, and I guess I'm going to have to watch the original Justice League to see this or <laughs> just wait for you to come back and tell me. <laughs> because I this is one I might be able to sit out on I don't know Ross might have something to say about that but because <laughs> ah, I'm pretty sure he's seen it so well it, it, he's not I'm sure he won't enjoy rewatching it <laughs> he has to for some reason I watched it again a few months ago at work and we were still like man this is worse than I remember <laughs> this is still bad so but yeah. i'm excited for this gucci movie that we're getting i didn't know anything about it ridley scott is doing a movie with adam driver and lady gaga like okay the photo came out and i thought it was a modeling thing like i legitimately oh, thought okay. it was yeah. for a magazine and i was like oh that's funny that act like that model looks like adam driver and like <laughs> didn't recognize lady gaga <laughs> like i was just t- and then i saw edits of it where it looks like you know Adam Driver and Lady Gaga are in Hoth and he has like his, you know, Kylo <laughs> yeah, <Ren> yeah, <laughs> thing and it's got like the oh. little at in the background. You know, it, it was really funny. So I just thought it was a meme. Like I didn't really realize until I looked into it a little bit more. And now I'm like, I know nothing about Gucci. I know nothing about fashion. <laughs> I don't really care, but I love the costume design already from the set photos we've been mm-hmm. getting. Um, if you want to check out any of the set photos, I'm sure we can put some on our Twitter page or our Instagram. You can check us out there. Any other movie news, Sarah? Um, there, like the the Gucci movie, it's probably going to be a long time until we actually even see a trailer for that, since they just only released the first photo. But something else that's only in talks right now is a uh, Steven Spielberg is making a movie on his childhood. So, um, yeah, I'm interested to see what that's going to be and like how he's going to do that. If it's just going to be like autobiographical or if it's going to be more like movie inspired and like a fun, like action or adventure (laughs) kind of thing. Like, I feel like it could go so many ways. Like if it's just like, you know, about him growing up or if it's about like him, how he like felt when he was a kid and what like inspired him. So It'll be interesting because like in my mind, I'm picturing a documentary, like I'm just picturing a biopic and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe like it would be really cool for a director to go, well, this is how my childhood was. And Mm -hmm. it's like crazy, like scenes and things like that. Like, you Uh know, in my mind, that's what Spielberg's childhood was like. But mm-hmm. in actuality, like, you know, it, it was probably super normal, <laughs> and, you know, and so I'm, I'm interested to see what he does with that. Yeah, like yeah. I've seen documentary on Steven Spielberg that I watched on a plane and it was great. I really <laughs> love just like learning more about him. Uh-huh. And but like a lot of those types of movies are always made by other people. Other so people, like, yeah. Yeah. Since he's it's making unusual. it his own and since it's autobiographical, I think. And I hope that he has fun with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm super interested just because like after like I've like reading and I've also seen like the Spielberg documentary, like knowing that one big element of his childhood was like that his parents got divorced. It was like a huge, huge thing for him. And so when he made E.T., that was a big element of the film. And in fact, a lot of his films deal with like broken families in a sense. And so I'm curious. Family dynamics are really beautiful in Spielberg films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious to see if like that is that I'm sure that'll be a big thing in this movie about his childhood. I mean, it seems from what I've read and watched it was pretty normal but like that's the one element that sticks out whenever whenever i heard that story i was like oh Mm -hmm. that'll be interesting i wonder how much it'll be like the mom and et or the mom and close encounters (laughs) or the mom and a lot of his movies yeah Um, um, yeah i mean aside from those couple news bits i think movie news has been pretty quiet i know uh oscar nominations came out today but we're not we're not going to get into those until we've seen more of the movies uh we both we you know all three of us i think daryl you saw judah and the messiah 
uh, the Black Messiah. Yeah, this I just weekend, watched that right? a couple days ago. So that I was need to my, know my one. <laughs> why he was only nominated for a supporting actor role because I'm pretty miffed about that. Like, I don't understand how you can be. I don't tell me, but I'll, I'm sure I'll find out. But. No, I mean, I don't. I I'm confused <laughs> as well. I guess I was like, no, they're both they're, they're both main characters. Yeah, so I'm interested this? to see how that gets justified. Um, he's another actor I just love to watch, so I'm excited to see that one. I think I might have missed it on HBO Max because I think it was done uh, this yeah. weekend, but I'll try and find it. Um. Well, I think that's all the time we have for this week. My name is Gracie and you can find me at Gracie May with a Y and three E's on anywhere you see fit. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Darth Daryl. That's uh, Darth uh, like Vader and D-A-R-R-E-L-L since nobody knows how to spell Daryl. Two every R's, other two L's. Is correct. Incorrect. <laughs> <so. laughs> And I am snotty dot person on Instagram and snotty underscore person on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter a whole lot though, so you'll find a pretty empty page there. Um, and snotty is with an IE, not a Y. We'll have to go into that one day. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you snotty person? <laughs> Um, check us out for the latest movie news at the popcorn bucket list on Instagram and at TPB underscore podcasts on Twitter, or just find us on whatever social media you use and tune in to our YouTube channel. If you want to see our beautiful faces, because you know, look at these guys, like <laughs> who could turn us down? Uh, we'll be <laughs> uploading the video version of these podcasts every Friday. So we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.